I know we're a few this morning, but I think there's more people out there than just a few mice. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. There we go. Somebody's awake out there. And good morning to those joining us online or later this week. Appreciate you joining us uh, through this uh, through the video. And trust that you are blessed. And trust that all of you are blessed this morning. And it's good to see all of you. It feels like it's been forever since I've been with you, even though it's only been two weeks. But uh, we had a good time out on vacation visiting family and friends. And uh, was gone earlier this week, or at the end of this week, with some village business as well. So it's just good to be home. And good to be with our church family once again. So thank you for coming today. And once again, I do trust and hope and pray that you will be blessed in all that happens this morning. A couple of things to highlight. Uh, in your bulletins, there will be an update on offerings uh, over the past couple of weeks. Uh, this coming Friday when the new bulletin comes out. Uh, so just in case you were wondering about that, that will happen. Uh, there are some prayer requests there. There were some updates while I was gone. Uh, Jewel is asking for continued prayer for her knee. And so if you keep her in your prayers as well, and I know Katie and her mom and her situation too, so remember to keep praying for them. Also, we want to remember to pray for the nation of Haiti. Uh, last sun Saturday, I believe it was, uh, they experienced another major earthquake which caused more problems for an already troubled nation. And so pray for them uh, in every aspect, um, everybody there. And then also, of course, we want to be praying for Afghanistan, especially the people of Afghanistan, whatever nationality they may be, um, if they're there in Afghanistan right now, it's, it's a tough situation, uh, to put it lightly. And so we want to continue to pray for them, especially for uh, the church, the Christians in Afghanistan as well. So keep that, them in your prayers. And also, some teachers are back at work already, and students will be back to school very soon. So be praying for them and their school year. Uh, they would greatly appreciate that. Um, also... Pray for Jim Renke. I hope you uh, were blessed by his message last week, his presence with us, but uh, it'll be a long time before Jim comes back here again because Jim is no longer the regional minister for our region. He has stepped down to take a pastorate at a church in Illinois. So he was feeling the call to pastoral ministry once again, and so he is uh, going to be uh, blessing the church there with his presence in ministry for quite some time. And so we're thankful for the ministry he's had to us and with the region, but uh, we're thankful for his opportunity to be pastoring once again. And the church there in Lincolnshire is going to be uh, um, really blessed as well. So really appreciate that. Trust that you had a wonderful uh, Sunday last week and that all went well and uh, that you were fed by God's word as well. A couple of announcements. Uh, there will be prayer service tonight at 630 and Active Faith Bible Study Tuesday night at 6.30 as well. Uh, if you want to help out at the pantry, they could use some help on Tuesday mornings and Wednesday mornings to pack boxes and baggies uh, full of stuff to be given out Wednesday evening at 4 o'clock. Uh, the ladies will be meeting this Thursday at 6 at the Pizza Ranch, I am told. Is that correct? Okay. I did not get that information until this week, and so everything had already been printed and sent out. So I apologize for that, but I'm sure all the ladies already are aware of that, but just in case... This Thursday at the Pizza Ranch in Baraboo, 6 o'clock, for a time of feasting and fellowship. Also, don't uh, forget, but in September, here on September 11th, uh, we'd like to do a go throughout the town and just share with people. Uh, knock on doors, just introduce that we're from the Baptist Church in town, and just wondered if there was anything that we could do for them, to pray for them about, and just let them know that we're here, that we care about them. And so we're going to do that on Saturday, September 11th, probably in the afternoon, uh, just to help with some of my time schedule as well with that. So keep that on your calendar. We need as many people out and about that day uh, as we can. So looking forward to those opportunities. I don't think I've forgotten any announcements this morning. Uh, thank you for letting me get through all of those. But uh, if there's nothing else that needs to be shared today, let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us together once again this morning to come and to worship you, to be reminded of your grace, your faithfulness, your power, your willingness, desire, and great ability to work in and through our lives for your honor and glory and for our good. Father, we thank you for our church and thank you for those who are here today and for those who continually and faithfully attend and check us out online as well. And we pray that you continue to bless and grow us to be born like your son, fed by your spirit with your word, that we might grow to be more and more like Christ. Father, this morning we think of those from our church.
church family who are not able to be with us today for a variety of reasons, and we pray that you would draw near to them, that you would bless them, and let them know that we miss them, and uh, care for them, and are praying for them, and trust that you are continuing to work in and through their lives. Many long to be here, Father, and are unable to on a regular basis, and we pray that you would just remind them once again that you love them, and care for them, and we do too, and that uh, we long to be with them again when they're able to be with us. Father, we do think of the prayer requests that were mentioned earlier this morning. We think of Joel and Katie and uh, their health and family situations. And we pray that uh, you would bless, you would intervene, and you would glorify your name uh, in each of those uh, people's lives. We pray that we would be able to give you honor, glory, and praise for what you are doing and what you will do. We also think, Father, of Haiti this morning and pray that you would be with those who are uh, recovering from the earthquake uh, this past week, that you would just uh, continue to provide all the help and um, resources that are necessary. We pray that you would be with the church and Christians there and help them to not only bring physical uh, comfort and healing, but also spiritual care as well. That even through this tragedy, the gospel might be proclaimed and that many would come to know Christ. We pray the same for the people of Afghanistan this morning. Uh, many are struggling uh, for a variety of reasons and many are in danger. And Father, we pray that you would bring safety that you would bring peace, that you would be with men, women, and children, be with the church, be with the Christians, and we pray that uh, and our military personnel as well, and other diplomatic uh, folks, and everybody who's contributed to helping our nation there in its endeavors, and we pray that uh, you would protect, that you would provide, and that you would rescue. And Father, may all the good that comes out of there be because of your work that is being done even now. We pray again, Father, for continued wisdom and good choices from our leadership here in the states uh, at all levels, but also throughout the world. All those who are involved in Afghanistan, Father, we pray for their leaders, that uh, they may do according to your will what is good and right and best for all people there. Father, again, we pray for the church, and we pray that you would continue to bless uh, your church here and in our community and throughout the world and throughout our country. We pray that you would continue to help us to stand firm upon the gospel proclaiming your word as you have given it to us and as you have uh, taught us to teach and preach and believe in it. And we pray that we would be faithful to you and to the ministry that you've called us to. Help us, fathers, uh, individuals, and as a church to be proclaiming the gospel, both in word and in deed, that many might come to know Christ as Savior. For our missionaries, Father, and uh, others that we know who have given their lives to full-time ministry, we pray that you would continue to bless them Give them the resources and encouragement that they need to do what you've called them to do. We pray that you would encourage their hearts and may they see much good fruit from their labor. And Father, we pray that uh, they would be blessed and be a blessing to the areas of ministry that in which they serve. Guide us now, Father, as we go to a time of singing and prayer and uh, Bible reading and hearing from your word. We pray that your will would be done in us and through us today. In Jesus' name. Stand with me, if you would, this morning, please. <clears throat> we recite together uh, Psalm 95, 6 and 7, and sing a few praise choruses together today. Psalm 95, 6. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his tent. Let's praise him this morning with great is the Lord, two times three.
choir there, remember me? <clears throat> chapter 9, just after the transfiguration, in verse 14, the healing of a boy with an evil spirit. Mark 9, verse 14. When they, meaning Jesus and some of his disciples, came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to meet, greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who was possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, and it throws him, excuse me, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, 
take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. Through prayer, through faith in Jesus, the kingdom of darkness, the world of evil that stands against, opposed to God and against God's people, is defeated. Because in Jesus, there is victory over sin and death and hell. Let us sing about the victory we have in Jesus spiritually and in this world even today. Hymn number 473, verses 1 and 3 today. Stand with me if you'd like. 473, Victory in Jesus. From the first of Uh, 
the, the, during the process of salvation. What is actually happening there? Looking forward to that next week. That's going to be a toughie, so pray for me, uh, if you would, please. Uh, but this morning, we're going to be continuing our gospel uh, messages in the book of Romans, chapter 3. So if you'd like to turn with me there, please, we're going to read several, actually many verses, from Romans, chapter 3, this morning. I must admit that this is a message that I gave a couple years ago, uh, basically on the same topic for the same reason. And uh, just, you know, when you do something, you, how much can you improve upon it? But it's been tweaked a little bit for us today. And a good reminder for each of us, including myself, that uh, the message of the bad news, uh, that we need to be saved from our sin, uh, is one that is of vital importance. And today, in today's church, it's one that is not mentioned often enough. And so we want to make sure that we understand the full truth, including why we must proclaim the gospel, why we must be saved. And so we look at Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 24 this morning. Because the bad news for all people is that we are all under sin and accountable to God for our sin. And we find that, especially in Romans chapter 3, 9 through 24. So if you read along with me as I read loud. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their way. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. Verse 21. But now... A righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God's word for us this morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your revelation, for your word. You have revealed who you are to us. You have revealed who we are to us. Because our hearts are wicked and deceitful, and we always think better of ourselves than we should. But you have showed us the truth, that we are a people in rebellion. We are a people who hate you, apart from Christ. We are dead to you, in sin until you reached out to us through your Son, Jesus, through the Spirit, through the proclamation of your word of salvation. We thank you for that salvation. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming and taking the punishment for our sin, that it would be taken care of and forgiven, the penalty, the price would be paid, that we might have your righteousness and live eternally with you. Lord, I pray that you would guide and direct my words this morning, that you would speak through me, that your truth would be proclaimed. Not what I think, but what you have taught us and want us to know this morning. And may our hearts be open and receptive to hearing this not-so-good news. May we take it to heart, and may someone maybe listening this morning or in the future hear this message, Father, and hear the truth of sin and our sin nature and need, and need for a Savior. May they see that need in themselves, and may they turn to Christ, we pray. Guide us now in Jesus' name. We have been exploring the gospel, what it is and how to share it so that we can be a blessing to others and expand the kingdom of God, the way that God has called for his kingdom to grow. Today we're going to jump back a bit and explore in a little detail why there is a need for the good news of Jesus Christ. If there is good news that needs to be shared and heard and believed in it, it's because there is some really bad news. 
Are we prepared to confidently and boldly yet graciously share that bad news so that the good news has the proper effect and meaning for those who have yet to hear it? No better place to do so than in Romans chapter 3. Many people try to share the gospel without talking about sin. And people who often hear the gospel given to them without having been told about sin wonder what they need to be saved from. Why do I need Jesus? Why do I need to be saved? Aren't I a good enough person? Aren't I going to go to heaven already anyway? Isn't God just that great, that awesome, that anybody can just go? That's not what the Bible teaches exactly. There is a sin problem. We are separated from God, and that needs to be resolved. And the good news is that it has been resolved in Christ. Paul is writing to Christians in the city of Rome. He is encouraging them and teaching them about their faith. And like most churches in that time period, they were a mixed church. They had Jewish people, they had Gentile people. Jewish people who knew the law, the Old Testament, had questions about the law and about you know, circumcision and all these other things. And then the Gentiles were like, what are you talking about? All we know is Jesus and faith in him. And Paul's like, yes, it all works together. And so this is how it works together. And so that's why we have the book of Romans. Um, in doing so, we get a very detailed explanation of the gospel and what it means to live as a disciple. And in Romans 3, we read about the condition of the human race. We as sent ones are ones who are to go and declare that there's a problem with humanity. And it doesn't take long for anybody to recognize that there's a problem with humanity. Everybody understands that there's a problem. Everybody just has a different way of going about trying to solve that problem. But there's only one solution, and that is Jesus himself and the truth that he proclaims. But first of all, this morning, we discover here in Romans 3, 9 through 18, that we are all under sin. I'm not going to read all of 9 through 18 once again, but just look at these verses in your Bible and look at the different ways it shows us that we are under sin. The quotes there, Paul is quoting Old Testament verses. And so we see that there's a charge against Jews and Gentiles. We're all under sin. So Paul's like, nobody escapes this thing. If you're a human being, then you have sin. You have a sin nature. You sin because you want to sin. And you have no other choice but to sin, save by God's grace to choose him. No one righteous. No one understands anything about God. No one actually really seeks God. There are a lot of people out there today who say that they are seeking spirituality, that they're seeking truth. But nobody can actually say that anybody else is teaching is actually wrong. Nobody ever wants to say that anybody is wrong anymore, except for us Christians. They want to say that we're wrong and everybody else is right. But that doesn't work. I mean, logically, that just doesn't make sense at all. But in this world today, nobody wants to say that anybody else is wrong. Even if you say 2 plus 2 is 17, they don't want to say it's wrong because you believe it's 17, so it's right for you, and so that's okay. That is bonkers of a world. But that's the world that we live in. No one truly understands truth, and they are, the world is actually starting to turn against even mathematical and even true scientific truth, because they are so depraved. No one truly seeks God. We've all turned away. We're worthless. Nothing that we do is of any worth, save from being saved in Christ. No one does good. Even the nicest, sweetest person you've ever met, who has never even committed a legal crime in the United States, is still an evil, wicked person because of their sin nature and their hatred for God, even if they never express that in words or in deeds. Look at this description in verse 13. Throats are open graves. Endless death. Practice deceit. Poison. They always say bad things. Mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery. Right? I mean, look at this description. This is horrible. I mean, it's like being covered in slime and tar and mucus and all of those sorts of disgusting things. <clears throat> Excuse me. And people want to say that they're good. The way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God for their eyes. That is the worst thing about humanity. No fear of God, our Creator and our Redeemer. No respect at all. And there used to be you know, just this kind of sense, even amongst the general population, even if they didn't go to church or attend a church, they used to have a respect for, for the things of God, the Bible and, and the people who were Christians and, and God himself. But that's gone now. 
we don't see that like we used to, which maybe is a good thing because people are actually living out who they really are, but there's no fear of God. Every human is infected with sin, verse 9. Paul teaches us of the horrible consequences of sin in chapters 1 and 2, and begins again here in chapter 3 with verse 9, explaining that every living human being is a sinner. First of all, we've got to define what sin is. Sin is breaking God's law in act or thought. It's anything that goes against what God says is good, right, and true, which is actually based on who God is. So it's anything that is against God. But it's also, sin is also a power or a force that kind of rules within us. We call it the old man, sometimes the old nature, the flesh. But it's that part of us that separates us from God, eventually leading us to eternal death, which is eternal separation from God. To say that all humanity is under sin is to say that sin infects and controls humanity so that we act or think against what God has said is right. Always. We're so infected that we cannot do anything about it in our own strength or will. We cannot pull ourselves up by our spiritual bootstraps. We cannot help ourselves. We are doomed unless something or someone outside of humanity acts for us and towards us in our faith. Verses 10 through 12, none are righteous because we've all turned away from God. There is nothing right in God's sight about humanity apart from Christ. No one understands, seeks God. No one is useful to God in our sinful state. We cannot do anything good. But yet God, it's amazing though how God uses the choices and actions of sinful people. We were just talking about that in Sunday school this morning. King Cyrus, king of Persia, actually made a decree. He felt and knew that he was led by God to make this decree to send the people back to Jerusalem so they could build their temple, rebuild their city, because that's what God wanted. And God used Cyrus's heart, his own determination to actually put that into effect. To be righteous means to be in the right, to be right, to do what is right according to God. And due to our infection of sin, we are incapable of any true righteousness. Because there is nothing of God within us anymore. Even the image of God within us has fallen. It is dead. It, it, there's nothing left there, spiritually speaking. And so sin extends to the entire person, verses 13 through 18. That's that great description of all of our actions. What did Jesus say? All that is evil and wicked and unclean comes out of the heart. It's from within the heart. All of us, the whole person, is infected. Every part of who we are. Our capacity and desire for sin is unending. Why do we think that we, as Christians, even struggle with defeating sin in our lives? Because sin is that powerful. We live deceitful lives apart from Christ. We speak ill of others. We're quick to harm others. We leave a trail of destruction behind us, not knowing the way to peace. And no fear in the heart of the unredeemed of God. That's the beginning of wisdom, God's Word says and the road which leads to redemption. It's what it means to be spiritually in poverty, spiritually speaking. Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. They recognize that there is somebody greater than them and that they do not measure up and that they need his help. And so we are all under law, verses 19 and 20 of chapter 3. Whatever the law says, it says to those who are under law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. We looked at that two weeks ago. Rather, it's through the law we become conscious, aware of sin. So we're all held accountable. God, through his creation and the revealing of himself and his plan through the law of Moses and the scriptures, will hold all of humanity accountable. Everyone. Everyone who has ever lived is held accountable, held to account for their sin. There is coming a day when all of humanity will be judged by a just and holy God, and those who are still in their sin will perish and suffer for eternity because of their sin. If you look back at verse 19, every mouth may be silenced and the whole world accountable. The law makes us conscious of sin. Paul will later say it. And later on in the New Testament, that he would not even know what covetousness was if there was no law to tell him that. He would covet anyway, whether there was a law there or not, because that's what sin does. But he was not aware of it until somebody said, that's wrong. 
Don't do that. And then, of course, what does the sin nature want to do? It wants to do what we've been told is wrong, because that's how depraved we are as a people. We become aware of sin. The law of Moses was given so we might know right and wrong. We become aware of that fact. And we cannot live up to God's law. When we give the gospel, when we share the gospel, at some point in time, it might not be immediately, it, whenever that happens, whenever it's appropriate, whenever you're led by the Spirit, at that moment, that time, as you're leading someone to know Christ more, sooner or later, we have to get them to understand that they need a Savior. And by sharing just the Ten Commandments, Okay, what do you call someone who steals? Go ahead, what do you call somebody who steals? A thief. What do you call somebody who lies? A liar. A liar. What do you call somebody who commits adultery? An adulterer. All right, somebody who covets, somebody who lies, steals. These are, and what do you do? That's what I do. We do. We all do these things. Have you ever lied in your life? Well, yes, I have. But it was a small lie. It doesn't matter how small it is. If it's a lie, it's a lie. It's a sin. And you can be judged for that sin, even if that was the only one you ever committed. But we break all of God's laws. For those who didn't know the law, given through Moses, uh, and their own consciences, conscience, yet yeah, consciences, makes them aware enough of who God is in his laws, that they too are accountable. In creation, we can see something about God enough that God can hold us accountable for our actions. And that we could possibly reach out and seek him because of the way that he has created this world and shown and displayed himself, revealed his glory and his power. In being aware of our sin through the law, we also learn that we cannot be made right by the law, for the law was meant to condemn, to show us that we need his help. No hope apart from God acting on our behalf. Which is why we are so thankful for verses 21 through 24. Amen? We are under grace because of Jesus. Once we recognize and understand that we are sinners, that there's nothing we can do in our own power, in our own strength, in our own will even, to be saved from our sin and the just consequences for our sin, we respond to the grace of God as the gospel message is declared. This righteousness from God, apart from the law, this is something different, has been made known, to which the law of prophets do testify. They do talk about God's righteousness and his willingness and desire and opportunity to save. Throughout the law, we see opportunities where God is showing and demonstrating through the sacrifices that God wants to provide a way, he has provided a way, that way will come through Jesus, his son. But those sacrifices point to that and point to the need of, look at what happens apart from God. You die. But with God, there is redemption. And this righteousness of God comes through faith in Christ. Righteousness from God, first of all, verse 21. Through the scriptures, God has revealed his righteousness, how he acts righteously all the time, every single time, without fail. He is always faithful and true to himself, his will and his way through his power. In his grace, he treats us better than we deserve. All of humanity deserves death, the just punishment for sin. And when we talk about death, we've got to talk about death. It's not like death, like physical death. And just being, you know, we have a funeral, we just kind of, we don't act, we don't get to do anything anymore. Spiritually speaking, we're still alive. People will live forever. All humans will live forever. It's just a matter of where they will live. The soul, the spirit of us, that inner part of us, that spiritual being that we are, that is in our bodies, will live somewhere, either with Christ forever and eternity, or without Christ. And we say separated from God, and God is everywhere all of the time, but God's goodness, God's grace, everything that's good about God will not be known or felt in hell. God's wrath, God's judgment, his anger towards sin will be felt in hell. And that's what we mean by death, spiritual death. That is the worst thing that could ever happen to a human being. God does not want that for us. We were not created for that. Hell was not created for us. Hell was created for Satan and the fallen angels. But those who follow him, instead of following God, will follow him to his eternal destination as well. We deserve death, eternal separation from God, the just punishment for sin. Yet because of his mercy, he provided a rescue redemption, an opportunity to break free from sin, its power over us, and its just consequence. 
And that, of course, comes through faith in Jesus. Only Jesus alone. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. No man gets righteous, or woman or child gets righteous. No one receives eternal life apart from him. His death upon the cross, which he took the punishment for sin. He died the death that we should have died. He took God's wrath, all of the anger and wrath against sin, for every single human being was put on Jesus on the cross. He took our punishment. There is punishment. There's forgiveness, but there's also punishment. Consequences still have to happen. God is still a just judge, and just judges will do the right thing every single time. And God, of course, is the just of just. There will be justice, either through the cross of Christ or paid personally by an individual in hell forever. Through faith in Jesus, he took our punishment for sin upon the cross, but yet was raised because he committed no sin. And so for those who believe in him, they can have forgiveness and eternal life. Verse 23, for all righteousness from God is given. It's a gift any sinner who believes in Jesus by faith can receive. Any sinner can be saved. Even the worst of mankind can be saved. A lot of people don't like to hear that Osama bin Laden or Hitler or Mao Zedong or you know, even some of the, the worst people now, even Taliban fighters in Afghanistan today, if they would place their full faith and trust in Jesus Christ and they're dead the next moment, they are with Jesus Christ. Because any sinner can be saved because that's how God has provided for salvation. Simply trusting, believing in God, who is just and true, and that Jesus did what the Bible says that he did. Full faith and trust in Christ and his finished work. Part of what it means to believe is to confess that we're sinners in need of God's righteousness, so that we can be saved. And if we're sinners, sinners can face punishment, sinners can also receive eternal life and can be justified, verse 24. They can be declared righteous, just as if they never sinned, because Christ's righteousness is in them. God sees us in Christ. He sees us through Christ, as if we had not sinned before, because of Jesus paying for our sins upon the cross. The great exchange, his righteousness to us, our sin and death and punishment to him. This is the bad news mixed in with the good news because you can't talk about the bad news without talking about the good news. We need grace. We need to talk about grace. We need to talk about salvation. But also there's a reason for salvation because we are hopeless without the grace of God in Christ. So for us this morning, we need to think about, our, have we first of all, have we repented of our sin? Have we confessed Jesus as Lord, acknowledging that we are sinners and believing that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and was raised from the dead so that I could have eternal life? Do we trust that when he says that we have faith in Christ and what he's done for us, that we will be saved? Have you done that? And are you able to share that message with somebody else? Either rather quickly or over a period of time. God works in both ways, and we need to be prepared to work in both ways as much as possible. We don't need theology degrees. We just need to know our Bibles, and we can all know our Bibles by reading it more and more each day. We shouldn't just read our Bible just to know God more, just to know Christ more, just to be assured of our own salvation and encouraged in our own daily walk, but so that we can share that, all of that, with somebody else, so that they can have what we have. And we must remember to include the bad news that leads to the good news. Now, we're going to always talk about justification and righteousness and propitiation and all these big theological terms. Not necessarily. In fact, I would recommend you probably not, unless you're talking to an academic who can understand all that. Not everybody understands all those big words. We need to bring the message to the people in a way that they can understand. You notice I didn't use most of those words this morning, at least not for very long, and not without explaining what that means. We need to be able to do the same thing. And if we're kind of stuck, we're not sure, then maybe we need to do more training on that outside of the Sunday morning message, and I'm more than willing to do that. We can do that. Sunday school and in our active faith Bible study, we can do those things. But make sure that you are, of course, walking with Christ, that you belong to him because you have confessed your sin and believed in him as Lord and Savior. And do everything you can to be prepared to share the gospel message whenever the opportunity arises.
the bad news leads to the good news. And we are so thankful for God's grace and the good news of salvation in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you for this reminder. We thank you for this teaching. It's not easy to hear that some of this is even true of us. We still struggle with sin. But yet we have the power of the Spirit. We have your word that helps us to overcome. Help us to have faith in Christ, not only for our initial salvation, but also to overcome sin on a regular and daily basis. But also encourage our hearts and comfort us. Help us to know that even the basic knowledge that we have about sin and salvation, the gospel, can be shared with those around us. We might not be able to explain everything in every little detail as well as others might be able to, but Father, we can continue to share the truth and the good news. And you can use that in somebody's life, Father, to draw them to yourself. And we pray that you would do so. Use us. Encourage us. Give us the desire to know your word, to know the gospel, the full gospel, the bad news and the good news, so that we are ready to share the message of salvation with those who need to hear it, those who need to come to Christ, which is everyone we meet. Give us opportunities. Give us courage. Give us boldness. And Father, we pray that people would be receptive to your word, to the gospel message. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close this morning, let's take our hymnals and turn to a familiar and favorite hymn, Amazing Grace. 202, first verse for us this morning. Because as we talk about the bad news, we've got to also celebrate the good news that God has reached out to sinners in His grace that we might be redeemed. <laughs> Thank you. 